So good morning. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Dan Quinn. I'll be the moderator for the first session. Um, so with that, our first speaker is uh, Cynthia Skirisi. <laughs> Close enough. So I'll let her come up and enjoy. Hey, So good morning, everyone. Thanks for the introduction, Dan, and for everyone coming here to my presentation. Today, I will talk to, uh, talk to about part of my thesis project titled Evaluating Short Season Soybeans uh, for Cover Crop Rotation with a Crop Simulation Model. So this is a shared project together with people from Ohio State University and University of Nebraska. So as an introduction, cover crops can provide many benefits, such as reduce soil erosion, increase and conserve uh, soil moisture, but also manage hard to control weeds. However, one limitation is cover crop establishment before the onset of cold temperatures in the fall. So some defining factors for an appropriate cover crop establishment are cover crop planting date, growing window, and biomass production. There is a potential management adaptation in where we can use short season soybeans to advance cover crop planting date, increasing its growing window and biomass production. One limitation of this practice is that um, using short season soybeans might lead to lower yield. So several soybean maturity group studies has concluded that there is, uh, that short season soybeans can reach similar yields than long season soybeans but also other studies have shown otherwise. So based on all these findings, we can say that maturity group cultivar choices that will advance soybean harvest without yield penalty will depend on location, management, year-to-year -year variability, and water availability. So to explore all these scenarios, a wide range of field studies are required including several locations, planting dates, and soybean maturity groups. But we, it will also imply a lot of work and budget, which sometimes could be limiting. However, with a well-calibrated crop model for a given environment, we will be able to explore unlimited management practices. So our objectives were to calibrate and evaluate this at crop growth model with experimental data for prediction of maturity date and yield, across Kentucky, Nebraska, and Ohio, and to conduct a sensitivity analysis across different scenarios to quantify soybean yield and maturity date for different cultivars, locations, years, planting dates, and soil types. These two objectives support our overall objectives, which is to determine whether short season soybeans could be used to advance cover crop planting dates. So we hypothesized that cultivar coefficients based on relative maturity group will predict date of physiological maturity and yield with the same similar accuracy than cultivar specific coefficients. And the rationale of this is because when using a cultivar specific, co uh, cultivar -specific coefficients, when calibrating those, we are not able to use those coefficients for other cultivars, even though they are the same relative maturity group. We also hypothesized that maturity group choices could change after conducting several experiments for different cultivars, location, years, planting dates, and soil types. So to obtain data for model calibration and evaluation, we designed a two years experiment um, in four locations in, ne in Nebraska, two in Ohio, and one in Kentucky. The experimental design consists of four maturity groups and within maturity group, four cultivars. For crop model simulations, we use this at crop grow 
uh, which requires as model input management data like planting day, row spacing, planting density. It also requires daily weather data, soil properties like cation exchange capacity, bulk density, percent clay, silt, and sand. And finally, we need uh, crop coefficients. Both soil uh, properties and crop coefficients require calibration. After the model is calibrated, we will be able to explore different scenarios. So we propose a simulation experiments using different maturity group cultivars across 30 years for many planting dates, soil types, and under irrigation and rainfall conditions. For this presentation, I will only show some preliminary results uh, for 30 years for a single uh, date, planting date, soil type, and uh, under rainfall conditions. So we perform model calibration um, across five common cultivars across locations. Uh, this crop grow has a total of 18 crop coefficients divided into six phenology coefficients, which we calibrated across all sites and 12 growth coefficients calibrated in the non-water stress sites. Additionally, soil parameters calibration was performed uh, for with water stress sites. And on a second step, we derived crop coefficients from calibrated cultivars based on relative maturity group, and we evaluated them across all sites. These are some results from, for prediction of sim, uh, model simulations. We have in the x-axis the observed date of R1, and in the y-axis the simulated day of R1, both in days after planting. And we also have the one-to-one -one line that will help us visualize results. We also evaluated model performance using root mean square error and model efficiency, which is a statistics that shows if the model is more efficient in predicting results than if we were going to use the average of the environment. This value, ranges from minus infinity to one, being values closer to one ideal. So looking at this, uh, all this information, we can say that the model is doing as good in the calibration as it does for the evaluation. If we now take a look at the same graph, but instead we have R7, which is soybean physiological maturity, we will see again that the model is doing as good in the calibration as it does in the evaluation. So as a preliminary conclusion, model predictions of developmental stages based on relative maturity group show similar model accuracy than cultivar specific calibration, supporting our first hypothesis. So I want to point out that the, for the purpose of this presentation, I will not show results for yield uh, because uh, we are still working on them. So now if we take a look at the same data, but instead we have we look at Lexington for 2017 and 2018, we can start using models to explore our question. Can we plant cover crops earlier when planting a short season soybean? So in this graph, we plotted in the x-axis the relative maturity group, and in the y-axis the R7, the physiological maturity date. In days after planting, the dots are the observed value measured in the field, and the line is the simulated value. So we can see that when, uh, when planting an early season soybean, we are able to advance physiological maturity date, advancing cover crop planting date, but approximately 10 days per unit decrease in maturity group. Now, looking at yields, remember that we wanted to advance soybean harvest, but also achieve similar yields than long season soybeans. So, we plotted in the x-axis, again, the relative maturity group, but instead in the y-axis, we have the yield in kilograms per hectare. And additionally to the simulated and observed value, we included simulations for a non-water stress environment. So from this graph, we can see that for water stress environments or under rainfall conditions, early maturity groups yielded less than longer maturity groups. However, when there is no water limitation for these two environments, there is uh, shorter season soybeans reach similar yields than long season soybeans. It is not the case of these sites. 
We also see that yield gap due to water stress uh, was higher in these two sites. And practically, there is no yield gap due to water stress for this location. So yield gap due to water stress ch change it uh, depending on location, soil type, and water availability. But are our results obtained from two years of experiment enough to provide a robust recommendation? So to address this question, additionally to the, pre the graphs that I showed before, we simulated exactly the same exper experiments with the same management, but we repeated it 30 years. <coughs> so we calculated the average across 30 years, which is a red line. And also the confidence interval, 75% confidence interval for those 30 years, showing the yield variability. We can see that there is a lot of yield variability there. But something that was really uh, surprising for us was these sites that even though we uh, have like 30 years and we have that variability, for that 2017, we were not even, results for 30 years were not even close to what we got in 2017. So our conclusions could change depending on the study period considered supporting our hypothesis too. And we can use crop models to reach more robust recommendations. So as final conclusions, model prediction of developmental stages based on relative maturity group shows similar accuracy and cultivar specific coefficients, supporting our first hypothesis. Still, there is calibration ongoing for yields. Early soybean uh, maturity groups were able to advance cover crop planting date without yield penalty under non-water stress conditions. And finally, experimental data from two years differ from 30 year simulations supporting our hypothesis too. And we can use cover crops to, uh, sorry, we can use crop models to provide a more robust recommendation. So with that, I want to thank all these people that helped me in the project, as well as my funding source. So thank you, if you and if you have any questions, please let me know. Ole has a question. Yeah, thank you very much. Very clear presentation and a good start for the day. Uh, in your study, you, you have the typical responsibility of, and task of, uh, <coughs> of, of steering a car that is pulled by many horses in order to keep them under control. What I want to say is, you said you will calibrate it model and you give us some some insight how you can uh, calibrate the soil part while on the other and there are crops drawn so I assume when you change the parameter in the crop it will affect the soil part and, and vice versa so how can you keep it under control to uh, to get what you want okay so the question was related of explaining a little bit more about the calibration of yields, right? Basically, okay. So how we do to do the, like both calibration as I explained of soil uh, parameters as well as crop coefficients. So um, as I, I, I didn't have too much time to explain, but the first, so when we go to this part, so those five common cultivars, what we do was to run this at glue tool. So we have some coefficients. And then as I told before, I derived the crop coefficients based on relative maturity group for the rest of the cultivars. This is just an example for Lexington, but some uh, the other locations have different cultivars. And we are also working with Ole because um, we are trying to use uh, soil uh, models uh, to try to calibrate soil parameters. So the idea is to use some models and compare out um, and compare its um, outputs uh, to see if we can reach an exact um, water holding capacity as well as um, soil hydraulic conductivity. So the idea is that 
we need to find a way where we can dis dis accurately describe soil characteristics that will uh, also help us um, reach similar yields from simulated and observed. And also, of course, use um, this, uh, this, uh, these runs to provide appropriate crop coefficients with non-stress uh, environments. Thank you. Well, uh, the question is related to if model efficiency is related to R square. So we need to look both together. We were discussing this with Monza the other day. So the model efficiency will tell you how the model is accurately predicting the results, but the root mean square error will define the spread of the between the observed and the simulated value. So if you have a low root mean square error, doesn't mean that your model will explain your uh, outputs. So it, it's important to have both, and we need to look at both. Is Princeton here? In the, in the, it's Princeton here. Princeton, do you have any questions? No. OK. All right, so our next speaker will be uh, Lucas Arajo. Okay, uh, thank you, Dan, for the introduction, and good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Lucas Araujo, but you're fine with that pronunciation. Don't worry about that. Uh, I'm under Dr. Barrett here in Weed Science. I'm presenting about a novel, uh, Kentucky Adapted Tolerant Clover. All right, red clover, uh, it's a legume uh, species commonly utilized as a forage. And as such, it provides nitrogen fixation. And this nitrogen fixation uh, enhances the soil environment and benefits the uh, the clover the, and both the companion crop and it becomes very beneficial if you're interceding clover in a grass pasture Because on the, the, the increased the enhanced soil environment it will end up Increasing quality of the, the forage and the yield of the pasture overall However, if you use this clover grass mixture as we use it here in Kentucky most commonly uh, You come across a great limitation which is there the majority of the herbicides utilized in uh, pastures will harm the clover and in fact in fact in this clover grass mixture there are no herbicides available for broadleaf weed control that doesn't that don't injure the clover one way to work around this is to develop herbicide tolerant varieties that would allow the farmers to gain access to the benefits of the clover and at the same time uh, maintain herbicides as a, a feasible option for weed control uh, Think of that, an effort to develop a 2,4-D tolerant line has started at UK in the late 90s by Dr. Norman Taylor. Uh, 2,4-D is one of the most common herbicides utilized in pastures. So with that idea, UK 2014 is now under development here. This line comes from the crossing of a Florida line with Canland. This Florida line is just being recently released. It was a population by then. It has a tolerance trait. And Canland is the, uh, an elite line also developed by Taylor uh, here, an elite line here from Kentucky that has winter hardness and all the characteristics that are interesting to us here. So in greenhouse experiments, we have demonstrated that uh, UK has enhanced tolerance to 2,4-D compared to Canland. And think of that, we aim to move to the next step, which is to test this novel line in the field. And to do that, we're approaching it here with two different objectives. The first one is to assess the field performance of UK 2014 in the terms of yield with and without 2,4-D treatment. 
A second objective is to evaluate a more realistic situation, which would be the uh, gra clover grass mixture, and we uh, under grazing. So we aim to evaluate the tolerance of this novel line to grazing in the clover grass mixture with and without the 2,4-D treatments. Okay, so for each objective, we uh, we approach each objective with a different study. The first study here is the tolerance to 2, 4D. So the clover was seeded in monoculture, both in April 2017 and 2018 at the Spinal Top Research Farm, so repetition in the year. We utilized an RCBD in a factorial arrangement with four blocks. So being the first factor, the clover cultivar. So we had UK and Canland. UK, the novel line, tolerant. Canland, the sensitive to 2, 4D. The second factor was the timing of application of the 14 day year. So we either sprayed that in uh, July, August, or October. The third factor is 2,4-D rate, 0, 1.12, or 2.24 kilograms of acid equivalent per hectare. That's uh, the equivalent to one pound and two pounds of 2,4-D per acre. Okay, uh, all right. So the data we collected, uh, the first one is season total yield. The clover regrows after harvest, it regrows from the crown. So each time we harvest it, uh, we were able to make three harvests, three individual harvests on the season, on the growing season. So the season total yield is the compound of these three individual harvests. Each individual harvest was performed one week after the 2,4-D treatments. Uh, we also collected injury one at the, the occasion of harvest, so also one week after the treatment in a zero to 100 scale. This is visual evaluation, being zero, no injury, and 100, the death of the plots. And we also collected regrowth uh, one week after their harvest. Then we evaluated this as a percentage of the untreated plots. Analysis was performed in SAS and Proclimax and means separated by the LSD test at uh, 0.05. Okay, some results here. Uh, so what is very interesting at first is that uh, this novel line yields as much, <clears throat> excuse me, yields as much as can land. So here the UK is in blue, can land in red. Yeah, and in a treated situation, they yield basically the same. In the low 240 rate 1.12, we had a significant reduction of can land's yield by the 240 treatment, and, uh, but not for UK. And the most interesting results come at the high rate, 2.24, where we see there was reduction of in UK, which we're not expecting based on our greenhouse results. And we are also not expecting that Canland would not be further reduced, that the yield would not be reduced more by the increase of 240 rate. So there's also an inherent tolerance in Canland that we were not expecting and we found. And it's worth to mention we didn't find a higher order interaction with the timing of the year we sprayed it to 40. In terms of injury, the results are more dramatic. The differences are more dramatic. Uh, the injury in Kenland was always worse than it was in uh, in UK, uh, especially in the high rate. The difference got even higher. And for regrowth, it's even more interesting. It follows the same pattern. The regrowth for UK is much better. And you see a little bit on the that's is lowing on that regrowth for Canland at the high rate uh, for UK. I'm sorry for, at the high rate, and Canland's regrowth at the high rate of 2.24 was very significant. Significant. So here we have an illustration of that. Uh, so all right, I'll not use this then. So what you can see here is that uh, the top is the sensitive line Canland. At the bottom, UK, the tolerant line. From left to right, you have increasing rates. So Canland control and UK control, you can see that the lines are very full. And there's still some weeds because there is no uh, herbicide application on these plots. At the low rate of 1.12, UK is still very full. The lines are very full. And you see uh, uh, some thinning on the lines. This is one week after harvest, the regrowth ratings. So you can see some thinning on the lines. Uh, of Canland. And at the high rate of 2.24, Canland is fried and the UK is still uh, regrowing pretty well. It, Canland will still regrowth from that, so by the occasion of next harvest they will be similar, 
but yeah in one week after harvest that's what we observe so because we've seen that slowing on the regrowth uh, we saw that situation we uh, thought if we did a mixed uh, if we have it mixed in you know, a mixed situation a clover and a grass what would happen would the clover uh, that slowing the growth would uh, uh, reduce stands and biomass across the season if that was the case so we set this uh, grazing study to observe that in May 2018 we seeded uh, we interseeded the clover in a fast to a fast scoop pasture and utilized it for treat RCBD again six blocks not a factorial but four treatments we had UK and Kenland untreated and we had UK and Kenland treated with 1.68 kilograms per acid equivalent uh, per hectare, the equivalent of one, one and a half pounds per acre. So in this case, the 2,4-D treatments were only sprayed at the beginning of the season and we watched the whole season for our variables that I'm going to show, but only one spraying at, in June 20. We submitted these plots to mob grazing in four different dates. Uh, and I thank Dr. Pfeiffer for the cute cow pictures this time. So we have four different dates of the mob grazing, 20 cows for 12, 12 hours. We visually evaluated this in a zero to five scale. Zero, no clover stand, five, a dense stand. Um, and we also subsampled the plots to evaluate the percentage of clover in terms of biomass we had in a plot. So the percentage, the amount of clover in terms of biomass to the whole mix, clover plus fescue. And we collected these, the clover we collected at grazing dates, the, the clover stand, and this uh, was evaluated four weeks after, about four weeks after each grazing day. All right, so some results. First of all, the controls are again similar. Uh, we didn't observe differences whatsoever in terms of clover stand, the visual rating for clover stand, but when we go to the treatments, the first three dates, and this is analyzed individually by date, so we're comparing only inside dates. You can see that uh, there is reduction in stand for both lines under treatment, but Kenland is more reduced than UK. And in the last date, you can see there is some recovery from uh, UK uh, under treatment, which is similar to the controls, and Kenland didn't recover as well. So he, it's, he, this is the illustration of that fact. Uh, of that data. You can see in the Kenland, on uh, the UK plots, the clover is all over. Uh, and in the Kenland, basically, this is at the end of the season, September 11th. There is no clover in the Kenland treated. So the, the stand is much better on this novel line. All right, in terms of biomass, uh, we saw a similar situation with the controls, no differences whatsoever. Uh, in terms of percentage of the clover on those plots. And again, a little bit of differences here, but the control was that the 2,4-D treatment was enough to reduce the biomass in both lines, except for the two last dates where you have uh, Kenland being worse than the other treatments. And in the very last date, you see the same uh, pattern as we've seen in, with the stand, and Kenland was not uh, not did not recover as well, um, and you can see that uh, it's, it's the worst of the treatments there. Although you, although you had some reduction for UK as well. So some final considerations on that sense. Uh, UK yield was reduced uh, less by the 2,4-D than Kenland was. Although we observed some reductions by the 2,4-D treatment in this novel line at the high rate of 2.24. And we also observed some inherent tolerance to 2,4-D in the sensitive line. Kenland is injured more. That was the most uh, obvious results. Kenland uh, is injured more and regrows less after harvest than UK following 2,4-D treatment. And in this mixed clover grass uh, pasture, the 2,4-D uh, was sufficient to reduce the stand and biomass of Kenland, and it did it in, uh, in uh, it much more than it did with the stand and biomass of UK, of the novel line. So considering this, uh, we didn't have the tolerance we expected to have. We're doing some reselection 
for tolerant populations. Uh, so far in a greenhouse environment with a very high and strict rate of 2,4-D. We are also trying to identify the 2,4-D tolerance trait. Uh, currently, the, the main method we are utilizing to do this is transcriptome analysis, uh, and which is, uh, was done in the field. Well, with field samples, and finally, we were replicating the grazing study for this year. And yeah, with that, I'd like to thank all, everyone that helped me, uh, especially Dr. Todd Pfeiffer and Gene and James and Gabe Roberts, everyone that helped with it, especially the grazing study in the field, and uh, also the weed science team, Dr. Barrett and Linda, that were helpful all, all through. So. Thank you very much for your attention. And yeah, I'm open to guess questions. Thank you. So do you guys have a hypothesis about what the resistance mechanism is, like other studies or other crops? Yeah, the question is if we have an hypothesis, is what the mechanism for resistance is. Uh, so, we have from Tara's work, which is the master student before me, uh, she did market uh, 2,4-D studies and it's very likely metabolism. But at this point, it could be metabolism for anything. So it could be a P450, a glutathione transferase, any of those, even a hydrolase, I don't know. So the transcriptome will show what kind of enzyme is doing that metabolism. So it's not a uh, target site mutation or anything, it's metabolic. Any other questions? Is that a laser pointer up there? Uh, yeah, there is, but I, no, I didn't. The okay, yeah, I'm dumb enough not to notice it. Thank you. All right, so our next speaker will be uh, Ran Tian. This one? I don't think there is one. Uh, oh, I think there's one. I think there's one. I think there's one. I think one. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to my presentation. So I was uh, I work in Dr. Sierra Paris' lab. Um, um, so today I will talk about uh, two of my projects. Um, so simply, I will talk actually two protein. And uh, I will, uh, first one is ABIS3. I will spend most of my time on this one. And then I will give a brief description about the new finding about separating. So at the beginning, like you will ask like, what is ABIS3? So ABIS3 is a B3 domain transcription factor, which is highly conserved in the plants. So it's not only in the Orbidopsis, but in many plants. And it's play a very important role uh, in seed maturation and the desiccation tolerance. I show the figure here. Uh, this is the seeds of Orbidopsis. So when it's, um, oh, thank you. I show, uh, this is the healthy seeds. We can see it's brown. And uh, when this ABIS3, this um, protein will remove the mutated in the plants, the seeds will die. So it's because the seeds is not prepared for the desiccation. So in other words, the seeds cannot survive from dry. So as I mentioned, um, this protein is also in other plants. So we can see here, this picture I show the ABIS3 also uh, in the maize called the Viviparous one. And uh, when this um, gene was mutated from plants, we could see the 
uh, the seeds already germinate on the plants, so before it is maturation. And also the similar thing happen uh, even it's in the wild type in the wheat. Uh, this is called um, pre-harvest sprouting. So this thing definitely will cause a lot of loose, uh, people lose a lot of seeds on this. And um, the annual loss uh, worldwide uh, from this is about $1 billion um, about this. So uh, I was interested in like, to understand what's the function of this protein, this transcription factor, like uh, how it's involved uh, in the seed development. Uh, my hypothesis is this ABI3 because it, uh, it is a transcription factor. It can direct, bind, and uh, regulate many genes that their target is like, which may be involved in the state development and the maturation. Uh, the method our lab using is um, both the one and the chromatin immunoprecipitation tiling array. It's called CHIP CHIP. So this method will tell us where, like which gene this ABI3 could bind to. And the second is using the expression array to compare wild type and ABI3 mutant. So this will tell us um, which gene the ABI3 could regulate. So combine these two methods, it will tell us where the um, protein bind, this transcription factor bind, and which gene is regulated. So I call this, it is uh, it's the direct target of this transcription factor. So here's the result. We found uh, there are 317 genes is direct upregulated by ABI3. And another 87 is direct downregulated uh, by ABI3. And there are many uh, other uh, candidate genes is indirect target. So, uh, therefore, I, when I get all uh, those data, um, this gene list, I did uh, um, the gene on tonnage enrichment analyze. It will tell us a functional profile of a gene list. So here I show this two figure. I show the um, over-represent gene on tonnage categories of the gene list. Like the, the left one show the, um, the gene list that's direct uh, upregulated by ABI3, and the right figure shows uh, the gene list that's uh, downregulated by ABI3, the over um, represent gene category. And then we could see the uh, categories like state development, state maturation, response to water, and the regulation of germination. All this category is there, uh, which suggests our experiment is success. And it's consistent with my hypothesis that those targets is involved in the state development. So after I get this data, I could do many things. And because of time limit today, I just want to mention two things I feel is interesting. So one question is this transcription factor could upregulated gene and also downregulated gene. So like why this? Um, so to explain this, I need to talk about cis motif. So cis motif is just a very small piece of uh, DNA uh, sequencing that uh, um, the transcription factor could bind to. The ABI3 is belong to B3 domain um, protein category. So it's normally bind to RY motif, this specific motif. And I highlight there, that's the only thing I want to say. So like, so, uh, we found like the gene list that direct up, direct up regulated by ABI3, most of them has this RY motif here. And, but in the gene list that don't regulated by ABI3 don't have this motif. So this suggests when ABI3 up regulated gene, this motif is required. But when it's downregulated gene, maybe uh, it binds to other motif or interact with other protein. So this this is um, this is just a, a result, and definitely they need like further investigation to confirm this. Uh, another 
interesting thing I want to mention is a, a protein family called DAF1264. So DAF means domain unknown function, like people don't know what's the function of this uh, protein family. And 1264 is just a given name, no meaning uh, to this, confer, this conserved domain. So here I showed the chip chip result. So we can see, for example, this figure, the peak shows where the ABI3 could bind to. And I find it, this ABI3 could bind all family members of uh, this protein family, like DAF, A, B, C, D, E, sorry. Uh, so because this ABI3 could bind all family members, five members of this DAF family, so let me thinking, uh, the DAF1264 must be has some function related to ABI3. And the answer is yes. So I treat uh, the I treat wild type and the DAF pentap mutant. So all five genes was mutated from plants with uh, ABA, abscisic acid. And I show the picture here. We could see after I treat with um, three micromoles of ABA, uh, the left, uh, the left is the DAF pentap mutant, and the right is wild type. We could see the wild type, most of them after 16 days, it already has green card leader. But the mutant still like a very um, small and don't have a green card lead. So I did a three replicate and just make the right figure there. Uh, we can clearly see to compare with the wild type and DAF pentap mutant is significant different. Uh, so uh, in short, the DAF pentap mutant is much more sensitive to ABA to compare with wild type. So this suggests this of protein family involved in the high response regulation of ABA response. Um, that's all I want to talk about ABI3 and uh, this protein. Uh, my another project, I want to talk about another protein called CEP18. So this protein uh, previously report is involved in the regulation of Sort stress. So I did RNA sequencing to compare wild type and the separating mutant uh, in for the Arabidopsis seven day seedling tissue. So compare uh, wild type and separating mutant, I have a, a, a gene list and I did a go term enrichment analyze. So I find uh, several overrepresent over uh, categories. So like I highlight this in the red, response to thought stress. So this result is consistent with a previous report that a separating mutant has a, a thought related phenotype. And also I find many other categories like a response to hormone, response to water, and a response to ABA. So this comes to idea my hypothesis hypothesis that CEP18 is also involved in regulation of other abiotic stress. So again, um, I treat, I use ABA, I treat CEP18 mutant and a wild type with ABA. Uh, this left figure shows I use uh, 300 and 500 nanomoles of ABA and the right figure shows another concentration, three micromoles of ABA. And in all the results, we could clearly see uh, the wild type is significantly different uh, with uh, my separating mutant. So this result suggests uh, definitely separating is also involved in the regulation of ABA response. And that's all I want to talk today and short uh, conclusion to just a summary what I taught today. So first, ABI3 could direct, express, and repress this target gene. And uh, uh, this may be because the difference exists in the cis motif between those group of genes. And the second, uh, ABI3 bind to all DAF family members and uh, DAF family uh, 
involving the regulation of ABA response. And also, separating is involved in the regulation of ABA response. Actually, there are many other things we can do in the future. As I mentioned, uh, as I mentioned um, the buff pentap mutant shows more sensitive to ABA. So I can test like other mutants in this family member, like quadruple mutant, triple mutant, even single mutant for different family members, like what's the ABA sensitive for those. And also, uh, the separating is not only expressed in the seeds, but also in the seedling tissue. So I was interested in to compare seeds and uh, seedling tissue. So actually, the RNA-seq and CHEP sequencing, I have already done. I just get the data this today, actually. So I need, I need to analyze the data for that. And also, as I said, separating is uh, involved in the ABA response. But the question is, you know, ABA separating is like a, a between them, there are much thing happen. Like what's the pathway? How they involve in the ABA response? Uh, so after I design sequencing, I have some kind candidates gene like uh, ABI5 and AFP2. Those things, I would like to know the relation between um, separating and those candidate gene. Uh, that's all for today. Thank you. If you have any questions, you can ask me. Now. No, I didn't do it. Yeah, that's a good thing to try, but we didn't do that. So the thing is, I so I have to say it's very hard to you can you take five gene in one hand, you need to you can all of that, and uh, one of the gene is very hard, like keeping an insertion down the work. I use CRISPR cas like you take that thing. And uh, when I have pentap mutant, I find this phenotype, I'm pretty happy in that any future work. If you double click the button on the pointer, you can cycle between that flashlight thing and the yellow dot. There you go. If you'd rather have the right yellow dot, hold it. Okay, there we go. All right, I'll ne our next speaker is uh, Keegan Smith. All right, so uh, good morning, everybody. I am a second year master's student working with Chris Matoka, and today I'm going to talk to you about the impact of ryegrass on a fragile pan soil. Now, I know what you're thinking. Not all you guys are soil scientists in here. What are fragile pans? Well, they're these naturally occurring dense layers of soil. They're often close to the surface and they've got a thickness greater than or equal to about 15 centimeters. So think of them as like this just thick concrete layer, almost like in the soil, it's gonna really restrict that root growth. Uh, and it's dense due to the cementation of aluminosilicates in combination with iron. So that can lead to things like high bulk densities or lower porosities, and that can lead to water problems. So it can limit vertical water movement. It can limit groundwater recharge. It can cause perched water tables or lateral flow that will carry your nutrients or your fertilizers out into those, uh, out into water. Uh, so this can cause a real problem. I had an issue where I had to wait for the field to actually dry up so I could go out and get my cores. Cause you can't drive a truck out there. You'll be halfway in your tires into the mud. So here's a picture uh, out of uh, Princeton Farms. It's a fragile Udolph soil. So that red arrow there is sort of indicating right around where the fragile band starts, there's this like bleached layer. It's not, homog uh, it's not homogenous, so it's sort of going in a pattern. Um, it's pretty shallow out there, uh, and this, this will really restrict those roots from going. Uh, and the big problem that we have in Kentucky is we have about 2.7 million acres of it. Uh, so if you go west of Lexington, if you dig down, you're pretty much going to be digging down into uh, that fragile pan layer, especially out in like Callaway County, you're going to have fragile pan. 
So the, the background research for this topic, uh, there were some scientists at UK, and they wanted to look at the, the influence of ryegrass on the physical chemical properties of a fragile pan soil. So they did one growth cycle of ryegrass over six weeks. And at the end of the six weeks, they split those cores in half and they characterized them based on certain uh, soil characteristics, uh, chemical and physical. And the main ones that I wanted to highlight were bulk density. So BTX, for those of you that aren't soil people, uh, BTX is the fragile pan horizon. Uh, top ones control, bottom ones ryegrass. The top had 1.76, the bottom had 1.62. So you had about a 5% decrease in uh, bulk density overall. So that could be more pores, that could be more uh, aeration in that, that structure that would allow more roots to grow. Um, so then what they did was they took water extracts from those cores and they looked at the diphenolics in them, which through UV biz, uh, and they saw that there was a pretty large increase here. There we go. There's a pretty large increase here. Uh, so they wanted to see what could be that huge, huge increase in diphenolics in that fragile pan horizon. So they did a mass spec on negative ion mode. On the right here, you have the control, and on the left here, you have the ryegrass core. So you can see there's a lot more peaks uh, compared to the control core. And a couple that I wanted to highlight that they were able to identify were this 187 one. This co coordinated to this azelic acid. It's an aliphatic. And then this 181, which coordinates to 3,4-dihydroxy-dihydrocinamic acid. I'm going to stick to DHPPA because I'll, it's a big mouthful. Uh, and that was an aromatic. So that was where they estimated that these, these compounds could be solubilizing those aluminosilicate minerals for the, the fragile pan horizons. So this is where my research came in. And the objectives for my research were to perform stirred batch experiments on fragile pan soil material, that Zanesville silt loam that I showed you, uh, in the presence of azelic acid and that DHPPA and monitored the release of those cementing agents. So the silica, the aluminum, and iron, and their interactions using UV biz spectroscopy. And then I went to sort of evaluate the potential of ryegrass to alter physical and chemical properties of fragile pan in situ uh, through greenhouse and lab studies using those intact soil cores. And I'll determine that using a non-destructive X-ray CT scanning method. So I'll show you a little bit of that today. So this is the Don Spark Symposium. So I have to show stirred batch stuff. Uh, <laughs> so what you take is a jacketed flask and you keep it about 23 degrees Celsius, room temperature, uh, put a 250 milliliter Nalgene in that, have a magnetic stir bar stirring at about 430 RPM, and over time, so what I add to that, 1.5 grams of soil, 148.5 milliliters of water, and then I add my compounds. What I'm focusing on this, just methods, the DHPPA, I'd add 0.1 millimole. Uh, so I'd pull out 10 milliliter samples over time, one minute, 10 minute, 20, so on two hour, three hour, two days, three days. I'd filter that through a 0.2 micron, and then I characterize that based on those elements. So for silica, I do a microflight auto reader at 660 nanometers for silica. And then for aluminum, I do a graphite furnace. And so just to look at some of this data, over time you can see this. So over time you can see this really nice parabolic curve. Uh, that's coordinating to the DHPPA, the brown is the control, and the purplish is the azelic acid. So azelic acid wasn't really doing as well as the control, which was just soil and water. So you'll see the aluminum next, uh, it's not really doing as well as the control. So we wanted to focus more on that D DHPPA, uh, it's a diphenolic. And uh, so it's got this really good curve. Uh, we haven't really fit it to any uh, models, like first order reaction, second order. We have to do a little bit more work on that to get a few more functions out. But we did do uh, silica release over time at different temperatures. So we did 23 degrees, just like that room temperature I was talking about, 15 degrees and three degrees, real cold. Uh, we saw there was a greater release of silica at higher temperatures uh, and it was a temperature dependent reaction. So um, the warmer the temperature, the more silica released. We'll stick to that. Uh, and then for aluminum, so you can see there's a bit of a mess going on the first couple hours or so. Uh, we think this could be due to pH issues or those finer particles reacting a little bit quicker. 
Uh, but once it stabilizes, you can really see that DHPPA. Now this is in PPB, not PPM, like the silica. Uh, you can see that that DHPPA is about 95-ish compared to the azelaic acid that's only about 15 at the end. So to help you guys visualize exactly what's going on in those first couple, couple hours, for the DHPPA, I did at different temperatures as well. You can see, once again, that temperature, higher temperature, more released into solution. And so with, um, interesting. Well, there'd be a UV vis spectra here that's not showing up, but it's showing up for me. Um, <laughs> just know that we did it at different varying quantities. Uh, so we had one to one, one to two, one to four, one to 10. Uh, so the one would be the metal, the, the second number would be that ligand, that DHPPA. Uh, we were trying to show that that ligand and metal would complex, and the more ligand that you'd have, the, uh, the higher the peak would be. Uh, that's pretty much what I'm trying to show here. You guys can't see it, it'd just be a peak going up. It's about 280 nanometers, so it's not visible on, uh, for visible eye color. Uh, but what we're trying to show is that that aluminum could be chelated out by that DHPPA, it's just yanking it out. So I wanna take these stirred batch procedures and I wanna follow these elements through in situ. And so what we're doing is we're taking these cores they're about 100 centimeters long, and they're about two inches across about, and we're putting these rhizons in. And these rhizons are installed just above the fragile pan. That permanent marker right there is right where that fragile pan starts. And we're out about midway through where the A and B meet. And we're going to pull out water extracts over time. This can get me about six mils. Um, and we're gonna be looking at, we're gonna do mass spec just like the previous study. And I'm going to be looking at that aluminum, silica, and iron. So I did this in the lab just to test everything out, just to make sure that I could actually grow this ryegrass and cores to make sure everything is working. I'm going to follow the previous studies, uh, fertilization techniques of uh, using ammonium nitrate, uh, triple superphosphate, K2O. I'm watering it daily to maintain field capacity based on weight. And so the objective of this study overall is to see sort of the structure changes of these cores. We want to see what that ryegrass is doing to the fragipan. So we need a way to do that without doing what the previous study did and cutting it open. We need to be able to sort of see a non-destructive way of doing it. So I'd like to introduce you guys to the newest patient at UK Hospital, um, my okay. soil cores. So this works exactly like you would if you go to a hospital, you lay down on the bed, you scan. Soil's not really moving around too much. It's the best patient ever. Um, you can really crank that machine up a bit. Uh, don't have to worry about overheating. We uh, pretty much turned up the machine to to uh, the max that it'll allow under safety setting. And so we're scanning it. As you're scanning it, it's taking like, think of it like a loaf of bread, but really, really thin slices. It's slicing and taking those images as it rounds. And you're getting these scans. And then it builds it into these sort of 2D images. On the left here, you have the AP. On the right here, you have the pan. See, it's a little bit more dense. This is before we've done too much to it. Um, and then you have to do a thing called recon or reconstruction. You have to sort of select a kernel. And for those of you that aren't doctors in the room, a uh, kernel is sort of like a filter of what you want to focus on for the image. So for us, we focused on one that was a little bit more sharper, a little bit more, uh, it allowed us to focus on those roots and those pores. You could literally draw a pencil around where those cores were, or pores were. And so then you segment out that data, and this is after I've sort of pseudo-colored an image, just so you can sort of see uh, how the soil would look-ish um, after, after uh, having some color applied to it. And then what we're going to do is look at density morphometry. Uh, so here, you can see these green are the roots, uh, the gray is little stones, pebbles, and the, the, the purplish-brownish around it, that's soil. Uh, so this allows us to look at our cores and see exactly what's going on in these cores without damaging the structure overall, uh, allowing us to sort of analyze it. So what we're going to do is we're scanning at pre-growth, which I've already done, and I'm familiarizing myself with uh, medical grade CT software. And, uh, and then we're going to scan at post-growth so we can see those changes and we can see 
how density is changing overall, how pore structure is changing all overall. And then for the, the big finish, Well, bummer. Well, these are videos. Um, it was playing earlier. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, it will rotate. But uh, on the left here, you have the AP horizon. On the right here, you have fragile fan. Um, just like before, the gray is sort of those really dense, dense materials possibly rock, possibly metal deposits. That's why in the fragile Japan, you've got this sort of conglomerate area uh, right over here. Uh, the green and purple are roots growing down. Uh, it sort of goes from a purple to a less dense green, which could be still live roots, uh, maybe with some cellulose still going in them. Uh, but this really allows us to sort of uh, visualize what's going on in these cores without sort of damaging the course overall. And so in summary, we are looking at chemical reactions through the stirred batch, then we're looking at these chemical reactions in situ in the cores, and then we're able to visualize them using this CT technology. So with that, I'd like to thank all these people that have helped me out. And if you guys have any questions. <laughs> Uh, I have not looked at clay mineralogy before or after changes. The, uh, the previous study with Dr. Karathanasis, who I'm not sure if you're familiar with, um, Dr. Karathanasis did a little bit of mineralogy work on the Fragipans, but that is some future work that I need to do. Iron, I, I've looked at iron. Iron's being a little finicky, you know. I wanted, I wanted to stick to that good data that, that you can show that I don't want to try and show anything that's a little bit iffy. <laughs> yeah, Michael. So I have a comment more than anything else. Uh, Keegan has spent many sleepless nights in our lab uh, creating this new technique, uh, tweaking medical scanner to do uh, water on the soil. And it was a non-trivial problem. And at this point, he understands more about industry construction and volume utilization than most pretty scientists are incredibly impressed. I really, well, you know what? You, anyone who has a cell phone, if you go to YouTube and then the My Lab, the Winkler Lab, should be able to see at least one of these um, because we posted one uh, recently. Um, this technique of uh, gray casting is going to just be really incredible. Uh, and the thing I've been so impressed by with Stephen is that you were willing to delve in and create a new instrument, new trick instrument to fit for this work. And you could just talk for an hour simply about what you've been doing uh, with us. If the videos worked. <laughs> well, that, uh, thank you. So our next speaker today is uh, Patrick Perry. Thank you. All right, y'all. Uh, my name is Patrick Perry. I'm a research coordinator, uh, staff scientist at the Kentucky Tobacco Research and Development Center. So a lot of y'all, I know a couple of faces out here, but a lot of y'all, I'm not around this building too much. I'm over in that fallout shelter across the street. Uh, so thank you all for giving me the time today to speak about uh, my project, which was the field evaluation of tobaccos that have been engineered for high leaf oil accumulation. Try to figure this out. There we go. So just a brief overview, we're gonna talk a little bit about cellulosic versus lipid-based feedstocks for biofuel production, uh, plant engineering efforts that have uh, been made to improve such, and then kind of get into the study outline and some results we talked about today. So in brief, cellulosic versus lipid-based feedstocks, this is something that we've all talked about 
uh, in your graduate studies. You know, sometimes the, uh, the biofuel is always a hot topic in undergraduate studies too. Um, so just an example of uh, cellulosic or also lignocellulosic uh, biomass feedstock production for biofuel. Uh, so we start with um, a vegetative biomass, in this case it's switchgrass, uh, chock full of cellulose, usually at the moment most effective is bioactive fermentation with yeast. Uh, that cellulose is broken down into ethanol and then blended with petroleum-based fuels to produce your, your biofuel. Uh, that's primarily uh, what's being done at the moment with ethanol production. In contrast, uh, lipid-based feedstocks, uh, the primary source of the, uh, of the carbon it actually comes from the seed. It's uh, lipids that are packaged in triacylglycerol or TAG. Uh, so TAG is a uh, glycerol backbone uh, that has three fatty acids esterified to it. These lipids are extracted and refined uh, down to uh, fames usually of 18 carbon chain length. And these can be directly used as biofuel in such cases, biodiesel. So if you've ever had a truck drive by that smelled like French fries, that guy was burning biodiesel. Uh, so literally that's what they've done is taken the vegetable oil, broken those down into these uh, single chains and uses those in biofuel. So that's a little bit of a background of that. Uh, both of these, have some disadvantages in, as far as scalability and cost effectiveness and applicability go. Both of them uh, are, the primary feedstocks are incorporated into the food system. So things like corn, soybeans, um, canola. Um, allocation of current production uh, supplies towards biofuel at current production rates could have potential economical impacts. So when you go to buy your corn at the grocery store, it's gonna cost you a little bit more or the meat that you get from the grocery store because it costs a little bit more to feed them if it's in case of corn, and then the arable land requirements to meet the potential demands uh, for these bio, potential biofuel is, are very high, and that's the case for both of them. Lipid-based crops, there's another disadvantage in that these, uh, the primary crops used are for seed-based, and the ability to increase the yield potential in these seed crops is somewhat limited at the time. So to remedy that, uh, researchers from the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization in Canberra, Australia, have devised a plan to uh, engineer tobacco for vegetative lipid biomass production in a high density system. So as, as opposed to using seeds for the lipid source, using actual vegetative tissues that have been engineered. So tobacco was chosen because of its high biomass potential on a per acre basis. And it's also quasi independent of current agricultural production as far as not being a food commodity per se. It's more of a niche market. So preliminary reach, trials of engineered lines from this institution in Australia showed pro quite a bit of promise as far as uh, high lipid leaf oil potential was concerned. So um, this is a little bit of a busy figure, but just to kind of uh, highlight some of the key components of these constructs. The first line we're gonna deem called the parental line or the base construct. These are all done in Wisconsin 38, which is a, not a commercial, tobacco variety per se, it's more of a research variety. Uh, we have a tripartite system that focuses on a push, pull, and protect type system. And what we mean by that is we're pushing as much metabolic flux towards lipid biosynthesis, pulling those lipids into tag packaging, and then also packaging those into lipid bodies using proteins. So what we have uh, are uh, wrinkled R1, or wrinkled 1, which is a transcription factor that's been known to uh, induce and overact the lipid biosynthesis pathway to uh, result in higher fatty acid uh, biosynthesis. Uh, we have uh, diacylglycerol acyltransferase, which is an enzyme responsible for linking up fatty acids into a glycerol backbone. And then finally, the uh, middle protein here, that's an oleosin, which is a packaging protein which protects the outside of oil bodies. So this is the pushing effect, pushing as much flux towards lipid biosynthesis as possible, pulling as much of those lipids into tag biosynthesis as possible, and protecting as much tag as possible with the packaging protein. That was the parental construct. The second construct called LEC2 was the parental tripartite system with the addition of another transcription factor called leafy cotyledon 2, which was also known to uh, induce uh, lipid biosynthesis and change flux towards lipid production. Interestingly enough, this gene in the LEC2 line is driven by a senescence associated promoter. And the reason for that is that uh, constituent promoters linked up to the LEC2 gene have been shown to uh, 
and not grow well. They don't grow well. They don't germinate well. It, it results in fatality. So they had to tag it with a senescence associated gene. So uh, hypothesis of this study is pretty straightforward. Our engineered tobaccos uh, have high oil uh, accumulation over time over the wild type. Our specific objectives were to grow the transplants in a commercial production system. So just as you would any other type of tobacco, quantify trends in leaf oil accumulation over the duration of the season. And finally, analyze the final biomass in terms of leaf dry weight, which is what we want, leaf oil content, and then also the lipid profile of those leaves. So uh, to meet all those objectives, uh, we had to uh, establish three different analyses for uh, each one of them uh, using the same, the same field experiment. Oil monitoring, harvest weights, and harvest oil content profile were all conducted in different fashion, uh, all using PROC limits. Uh, but all of them were uh, randomized complete block design. Uh, with variety as the main treatment and then uh, split treatments as appropriate for each one of the uh, respective objectives. Uh, as with all engineered outdoor research, we had to get proper permitting from the United States uh, Department of Agriculture. So for both 2017 and 18, which is when these studies were uh, occurring, uh, we had to uh, get the appropriate permits from the USDA and also the Institutional Biosafety Committee to conduct these field trials out of Spindle Top Farm. So experimental timelines this is something I really want to uh, hit home with the audience here today. So in 2017, we had a logistical setback of acquiring the seeds for these constructs from Australia. So I don't know if you all know, but in Australia, tobacco is just as bad as marijuana is in Kentucky. So like nobody can have tobacco. So it's very hard to deal with out there except for research institutions. So we got the seeds really late, resulting in a late June 9th seeding and also a late July 25th transplanting. That is so far late compared to commercial transplant production, it's not even funny. 2018, we had a little bit of a better luck. We had appropriate seeding well within the confines of standardized commercial production practices at March 27th, and then transplant on June 4th. So what I wanna take home from this is in 2017, uh, the plants didn't really get an opportunity to grow for a full season. So resulting phenotypes, up at the top, these are plants that were grown in the greenhouse. Down at the bottom, plants grown out in the field. And in the left is the wild type. And on the right is the LEC2 construct, which is these are the two that we grew in 17. So you can see in both uh, growing situations, the wild type has wide, robust leaves at an upward angle of 45 degree and uh, are very full plants, full large plants. As opposed to the LEC2 transgenic line, these plants were very petite in stature, had very small leaves, and had a characteristic downward cupping of a peripheral lamina that was observed in both years. In 2018, we had the addition of the parental construct. So these are field pictures from that study. Again, wild type, large, robust, wide leaves, upward 45 degree angle, almost a cigar type tobacco, as opposed to the LEC2 at the top right. Again, smaller, petite leaves, shorter in stature, and that characteristic downward cupping of the peripheral lamina. And then the parental line down here, which had very short, almost non-existent internodal spacing, very dense leaves, very small leaves. It was almost like growing bushes out in the field. This was not normal looking tobacco at all, which is usual. So in 2017, that was the only opportunity that we had to uh, take intermittent uh, tissue sampling to monitor uh, oil accumulation. So again, 2017 was not the ideal year. Uh, more or less, uh, the oil, uh, would drop somewhat in the middle of the season during the high temperatures and came back on average in the LEC2 or transgenic line. And oil is always at or below 2% uh, in the wild type line at every single sample point. So harvest weights were significant for variety in 2017. I have highlighted here what we want to talk about just to show you how bad 2017 was in terms of being seeded late. We only recovered 1,400 pounds of dry leaf per acre in the wild type. Typical tobacco is anywhere from two to 3,000 pounds per acre, so this was way off. In the LEC2, or our transgenic line in the field, only 500 pounds of dry leaf per acre in 2017, which is not very good at all. We had a lot better luck in 2018. Uh, with the addition of the parental construct, we did end up having a not a significant interaction for variety as far as dry leaf was concerned. But if you look at these numbers, we had a significant increase in, in biomass compared to 2017 with the wild type having about 4,000 pounds of dry leaf per acre, 2,800 for the uh, LEC2, and about 4,200 for the parental line. So oil by leaf position, so what we did is we kind of looked at the oil gradient at 
the top leaf quadrant in the middle, well, top third, middle third, and bottom third of the plant. Uh, so this was significant for variety and also leaf position. Uh, not to get too bogged down by the statistics, but if you look here, what I would like to highlight is that the top leaves always have the highest amount of oil concentration uh, as opposed to the bottom. And we saw that in both the wild type and the lek too. This was further accentuated in 2018, where you can see that same trend happening, where the top leaves had the most oil, the bottom had the least, and the parental and the lek too also followed suit. To summarize all of this, this is the real main graph of this entire presentation. If you look to the second uh, grouping from the left, the less lek two configuration, we were able to achieve 19.3% oil per leaf dry weight, which is almost unheard of as far as engineered tobacco is concerned. Uh, that was not uh, less than too much by using leaves in the middle position. However, in the bottom position, our leaf oil was somewhere about around 9%. The parental line, though higher than the wild type, was at or below about 5% and the wild type line was at or below 2%. So we were able to achieve a significantly higher oil content in our uh, LEC2 configuration and also parental, though not as much. So another interesting characteristic we looked at when we started getting this data back, if you're looking at the right, this is the wild type uh, oil profile or the fatty acid profile that we pulled from those leaf samples. Uh, so if you look, uh, there's a high proportion uh, compared to the others that we measured of uh, alpha, linolenic acid. So if you look, the addition of the parental construct into our uh, Wisconsin 38 line, you start seeing a displacement of that alpha linolenic acid with linoleic acid. So there's almost a stopgap of that third desaturation event. And that's further accentuated in the LEC2 line, where you almost had complete displacement of alpha linolenic acid with linoleic acid. So you compare that to the wild type, the oil profile is greatly affected by these constructs. So in summary, uh, we were able to seed and uh, propagate these transplants in a commercial type fashion. Uh, both the parental and leg two had higher oil than the wild type, increasing oil accumulation gradient from the bottom to the top leaves. The resulting fatty acid profiles of 18 carbon chains are favorable or can be favorable for biodiesel or other applications and one or more construct elements affect fatty acid biosynthesis and also modification pathways, which would require further investigation. So future work, further line evaluation, implementation of a possible harvest, multiple harvest system, which I tried this year, it didn't, didn't work. Uh, incorporation of constructs into a better, higher biomass line as opposed to that Wisconsin 38 research line, and also possible elucidation of construct component effects on fatty acid biosynthesis and modification pathways in the future. So I would like to acknowledge all my uh, faculty uh, advisors, the CSIRO, KTRDC, uh, especially David Hildebrand for starting the uh, lipid analyses in 2017. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to have the funding to carry that in 2018. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you all very much. So uh, the question was, why was lipid concentration so different in the area of the plant as far as leaf position is concerned? We have to uh, I happen to think that's probably a function of leaf age. So as the leaves are older on the bottom, you might be starting to have a little bit of lipid de degradation <coughs> as opposed to the younger leaves at the top, where, the, where we have a large high amount of, uh, of cell proliferation. The newer cells, uh, all, they're making lipids anyway, so I think that the higher concentration has to do with younger leaves uh, as opposed to the lower leaves. Thank you all. All right, well, we're on break now, so we'll start back promptly at 10 25. Just been sticking them on here.